The J.C. Lee Dugard abduction case has stunned the public and confounded investigators. It's one of the most extraordinary kidnappings in American criminal history. An 11-year-old girl grabbed on her way to school and held captive in a backyard in California for 18 years. Neighbors say they spoke with her through a fence and saw her two children. So how was this kept secret for so long? Dugard's torment ended when a police officer and her colleague acted on a hunch. After a chance encounter with Philip Garrido, the kidnapper, they started probing, asking questions. His answers left them baffled. The two sat down with Nightline contributor Lisa Ling for this interview. Some answers came today about the couple who allegedly abducted J.C. Dugard. And at this point in time, I will order uh, Mr. Garrido to be held without bail. Philip Garrido, 58, and his wife, Nancy, 54, pled not guilty to 29 felony counts, including forcible abduction, rape, and false imprisonment. Law enforcement says the Garridos grabbed then 11-year-old J.C. from the street outside her childhood home. My daughter was just kidnapped, top of the hill, with a great forge. They brought her here to their house in tiny Antioch, California, where she lived in a series of makeshift tents hidden in the backyard. This is where J.C. allegedly lived for 18 years. All of the sheds and the tents had electricity furnished by electrical cords. Nothing more sophisticated than that. There was a rudimentary outhouse and a rudimentary shower, as if you were camping. During her 18 years in captivity, J.C. gave birth to two daughters, now 11 and 15, both fathered by her alleged kidnapper. It seems that neither J.C. nor her children had ever seen a doctor. During that time, no one stopped Philip Garrido until he finally walked into Lisa Campbell's office at the University of California Police Department on the Berkeley campus. So I assume Monday started as though it was a typical Monday? Nothing unusual until about 1 o'clock. What happened? About shortly after 1, I received a call from our records clerk um, at the front desk. And he called and said that there was a gentleman who wanted to discuss a special event. So when he came in, I noticed he had two children with him. Um, two little girls. He came in and said he wanted to talk to me about an event that was going to change the world. He appeared to be a little unstable. He was all over the place. He was extremely animated. He identified himself as Philip Garrido. And I said, what's the name of the event or what's the nature of the event? And he said, it's God's desire. Entered in and said, okay, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow at two, between 2 to 2.30. He says, okay, great. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. You'll be so happy with this. And so he left the office, and I was leaving the office shortly after him, so he left the office with the girls. Concerned, Campbell asked UC police officer Allie Jacobs to look into Garrido. That started a chain of events that led them to unwittingly crack the 18-year kidnapping case. I contacted Allie and, and informed her basically what I told you. Allie, you know, I got this guy, he's coming in, he's got these little girls with him. He's really a little peculiar guy. Would you mind just sitting in as just a trained observer, another eye to kind of figure out, maybe see something I didn't see, just another witness to what was going on. And she says, well, if you're that concerned, you want me, let's run him, let's look into this guy. Find out he's on federal parole for rape and kidnapping and he's a sex registrant. And so concerned about the sex registrant and the kid part of it, I went into Lisa's office and I told her, and she was kind of surprised, um, and I said, you know, what do you want me to do? And What do you need from me? And she's like, you need to sit in here with me. This is your office? This is my office. This is where I was sitting. And Garrido was pretty much in this space up at the desk and, and just being occupying this whole space right here. Jacobs Garrido turned her attention the to the young girls. At first, he was talking so much about so many different things. I said, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but who are these lovely young ladies that you brought? And he said, oh, these are my daughters. So what did you talk about with the girls? They told us how old they were. And, and I think Lisa said, oh, you know, why aren't you in school? And it was like both of them simultaneously. We're homeschooled. And I was OK. And then I noticed that the younger one had a, a bump on over her eye kind of hidden by her hair a little bit, but it was it was big. So I asked her, I said, what happened to your eye? And, and she just, without missing a beat, you know, it's a birth defect, it's inoperable, and I'll have it for the rest of my life. And the way she responded to that, kind of really, yeah, it was rehearsed, but it caught me off guard. But I really think that my mother's intuition at that point kicked in. And I, I wanted to basically ascertain if these girls were okay. From a mother's, not from a cop standpoint, from a mother's standpoint. It was like a wall. It was like talking to a robot almost. It was more like they were programmed. Right. They were pro this is who we are. And, and they almost, the, the older one almost had a pride 
Of her father. Of her father. Her father was was the Lord in her eyes, it seemed. Absolutely. Like she was just looking at him like he was a superstar. What did they look like? What were they wearing? It was almost like a little house in the prairie type attire is the best way I can describe it. And they were very pale. They were very pale. Blonde hair, bright blue yeah. eyes. I commented that yeah. they had the same blue eyes that he had. And they were just just intensely blue eyes. Were they clean or they were, yeah. they were clean and, and they were they were well groomed. Yeah. They just did not appear to be um, well nourished. Had you ever encountered children like this? The younger one had a look like if I could only tell you. I'm thinking like a cop now. I'm also thinking, can I get these girls away from him to right. talk by them by themselves? And then I'm thinking, well, I know he's on parole. He's got a parole agent. Worst comes to worst, I don't have anything right now. I'll call his PO and and we'll discuss what they can do from there. And maybe they can call child services. Maybe they know more about the situation than I knew at that time. So as you're having this conversation with them and watching these kids, what are you feeling? I was kind of disgusted because I'm thinking of all the scenarios that are yeah. going on. And I felt like I just wanted to grab him and take him away from this man, but I couldn't. I felt helpless at that point. With little evidence to act on, Campbell and Jacobs say they had no option but to let Garrido go, but the bizarre encounter haunted them both. I was listening to my gut, not only as a mother, but as a police officer. I knew that something had to be done, and the only thing I could come up with, and I told Lisa, is I'll call his probation officer. And I, when I mentioned the, the daughters, he said, wait a minute, he doesn't have any daughters. My stomach dropped. After that conversation with the parole officer, it was only a matter of hours before the Garritos were in police custody. But could JC have been saved sooner? On November the 30th, uh, 2006, we missed an opportunity to bring earlier closure. A caller to our 911 dispatch offered that there were tents in the neighbor's backyard, that people were living in them, and that there were young children. We made contact uh, with Mr. Garrido in the front yard of his home. The responding deputy determined that there was not any criminal misbehavior. This is not an acceptable outcome. Other neighbors also seem to have been aware of the young girls living in the backyard. They used to talk with the little girls through the fence, but that they never played with them or anything. They actually just talked with them. The yeah, fence. and there was a little hole through the fence, and we used to look at her and we used to talk. In his mea culpa today, the sheriff whose department missed JC in 2006 said they should have acted more like Jacobs. You know, I'll give you a classic example of what I would describe as world-class police work. Good instincts, good reactions. Go to UC Berkeley campus police. I mean, that's, that, uh, what, what that officer did over there uh, was world-class. I mean, her instincts led her to ask some questions, which led her then to call uh, a, a parole officer. I'm the only one, and Lisa was the only one, that really know, that knew what happened that day. And so I was, I was watching the news going, that's, that's not what happened at all, but I'll get my chance to tell my side of the story. And all the pieces lined up, all the stars lined up on this one. Thank God we've, you know, this girl is it out of It was great this. teamwork. It was not yeah. one effort by one individual person. It, it was probably one of the best examples of teamwork and law enforcement that I've seen. And I'm just so sad that she suffered for so long. I'm Lisa Ling for Nightline in Berkeley, California.